this is kind of an academic title, sorry about that, um, for what's really about identity in video games um, and how video games interface with who we are, what our identities are, and in particular in this uh, space of designing video games that are explicitly created uh, to serve as therapeutic interventions for people who have uh, a variety of conditions that require uh, what would be conventionally delivered, conventionally delivered therapy. Uh, so before I get in, I want to tell a little bit of a personal story uh, about how I kind of came into this field. Um, a number of years ago, when I was in college, I was studying to be uh, an engineer and a mathematician, and I got very sick. I had a, a very serious endocrine disorder that I was diagnosed with. And in the few months following this diagnosis, I was kicked out of school, I was kicked out of my apartment, I lost all of my social group because I, it was entirely constructed around being in university. Uh, I lost all my independence, I had to move back in with my parents. Uh, and I lost all of my well-being. Uh, the disease was affected my personality, it affected my mental state, it affected my physical state, uh, and it was very difficult that it took some, somebody that I was, and in a few months, took all of that away. And over the next year and a half, I started healing, but it wasn't really going very well. Uh, medicine didn't work, I eventually had to do radiation treatment, uh, nothing really serious. Um, but I wasn't really getting back to the place where I wanted to be until I got into a video game. And this video game wasn't designed for therapy. It wasn't designed to like heal people with thyroid disorders. It was just a video game that gave me a universe that I could be good at something. It gave me a universe that I could connect to people. And it gave me a universe where I had choice again. Um, and as time went on, uh, I became better and better at this video game. And the better I got at the video game, the more I healed. And the more I healed, the better I got at this video game. And it had this very positive feedback cycle uh, to my mental and physical well-being. But at the same time, there was something else that the game was doing. And that is that right before I got sick, I had a very strong identity. I was a student. I was a scholar. I was a researcher. Uh, I was very proud of who I was. I was very proud of what I was doing. And I was beginning to... Uh, understand that I was bisexual, and I was beginning to embrace that part of my identity. Uh, and then when I got sick, all of that went away. It was gone. Um, and so when I started playing this game and getting into it, as the dominating factor in my life, which was my illness, became less and less, I tried to resurrect that identity. But the culture that was embedded within the game prevented me from doing that. I couldn't get back to school because I wasn't cleared yet. I didn't have the money to, to go back yet. Um, so I couldn't be a student. I was just a gamer. Uh, I tried coming out again. And I couldn't do that because being queer in a hostile gaming community isn't really the easiest thing to do. Um, and gender was like not even going there. Um, so the game suppressed my identity throughout this, the course of it. And it wasn't until later, I, I, when I finally got to the point where I quit the game, I had a job, uh, I had relationships, it was good, uh, I quit the game, and then I was able to work on becoming who I was. And that took me about 10 years. So I went from, on this trajectory, having that trajectory uh, impeded by a medical condition and then impeded by a cultural condition uh, that took me 10 years to recover from. And basically what the result was is that this game, participating in it, gave me two choices. I could either be good or I could be myself. And it was clear when I first started that I needed to be good. Being good was what was healing me. And so I gave up on being myself. But when I quit I, and started developing games professionally, I thought about what would happen if I didn't have to make that choice. What if we could de design games where identity was a key part of what the game was about, and we didn't force people to choose between being good at a video game and healing and being the person that they want to be? And so when I started designing uh, video game therapy systems, uh, you know, I, I 
I didn't really know, couldn't really grasp what it was about the game that was suppressing my identity. Um, you know, I was looking at scientific things like, you know, what's up with therapy? You know, if you talk to any therapist, whether it's a, a, a mental health therapist or an uh, occupational therapist, they'll always say that adherence to whatever is being prescribed is one of the biggest barriers to success. And video games, like achievement farming, it's super real, right? Like, it's not hard to adhere to logging into WoW every day, you know, so you can do your dailies. Like, that's a thing that, that's a behavior that the game has designed uh, that people are very good at keeping up with. Uh, motivation in therapy is really difficult. You know, it's really difficult to go, to get up and do the exercises that hurt you or that take time out of your day. Um, but video games, they pull you in. You want to play them. Uh, therapist time. It's really hard to come by. It's really expensive. There are lots and lots of therapies for different conditions that they have shown that if you can get a person into an office three times a week, that therapy is all that is needed to recover from their condition. But that's a really hard thing to sell. You can't, you know, not everyone can afford that. Not everyone can afford that their schedule. Not everyone can afford that with their, you know, financially. Insurance usually only covers a finite number of sessions uh, per year. Um, but with video games, now we have all this technology. We have Kinects, we have Wiimotes, we have Leap Motions, we have uh, smartphones with accelerometers. So we have all this technology that allows video games to do what a therapist could do in the sense of it can manage what the user is doing. It can encourage the user to do it properly. Um, and so there's this very uh, attractive idea that video games and therapy can be combined. And a lot of people have tried this. There's a lot of products out there that uh, claim to be, able, be uh, workable therapy video games. And most of these products make a few assumptions, the first being that therapy is boring. Uh, this is a video game that we designed for vision therapy for kids uh, on the picture here. They assume that technology makes therapy better. There's uh, companies out there that build high resolution camera systems so that you can track what your limb is doing if you're doing physical therapy. There's uh, digital journals if you're trying to quit smoking that help you log your cigarette usage. Uh, so it's an assumption that technology will help us heal. We also assume that technology makes games better. You know, games now are way more involved than they were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, we have much more technology. We have always on internet. We have smartphones that are supercomputers that sit in our pockets. And the other assumption is that games are fun. We like playing games. We have fun when we play a game. It's a, a social experience. It's a stimulating experience and something that we, that is a, a, an activity of pure enjoyment. And so we look at designing a therapy and we say, okay, so let's build a therapy video game. What is it that we're going to put into the game? Um, and so one of the things that some therapists will look at are activities of daily living, uh, particularly in occupational therapy following uh, an injury or an acquired uh, medical event. You might look at, the first thing you want to do is make sure that the patient can get back to taking care of themselves. Uh, so some things are eating, dressing, going to the bathroom. Uh, these are very basic uh, needs that we need to to perform in order to be able to care for ourselves and retain our independence. The problem with this is that these activities are kind of like Uncanny Valley. You, you, it, you really can't virtualize going to the bathroom. Um, you can, but it's a hard sell. Um, so there's, there's another category called instrumental activities of daily living or instrumental ADLs. This is things like shopping, cooking, uh, doing housework, uh, taking care of your finances, um, organizing your clothing, doing laundry, that sort of thing. You know, sort of the next level of self-care. Uh, trying to restore that functionality to a person that has uh, acquired a disability, for example, is a primary goal of, of therapy. Uh, the problem with this is, you know, we can, these are things that are easy to virtualize. This is the, the image that we have here is from a video game that we built um, called uh, Voda. It's a virtual occupational therapy assistant. And so in the first prototype we had, 
a cooking activity, and we had a, an act activity for putting away groceries. And so that works. That's easy to virtualize. But is it really a game? Like, is this a game that we can play in real life? Um, what would we do to make it more fun? Um, and it turns out there are some things you can do, but a lot of these things are kind of boring. Like, you can only make putting away your laundry so interesting for so long. Um, and the other issue is that these activities for some people are also very gendered. Uh, particularly, VOTA is designed to help people following a stroke, an acquired brain injury. Uh, and a lot of the users of that software are 60, 70, 80 years old. And culturally, they come from a place where certain people, things like shopping and putting away groceries, that was not their work. That was the other gender's work. And so they're asked to be doing this activity, and it's actually not really helping them. They're feeling very uncomfortable because they don't understand how to do it. They're not, it's not a thing that they've, all, they've ever done before. And it, they're feeling like this other gender's activity is being pressed onto them. So that's not the best thing to do. And so there's a lot of resistance to that. And so we think, I, I look, went and I looked back and said, OK, why is it that video games pull you in? What is it that's about video games that is interesting? And it turns out that games aren't fun. They're not. They can be, but they're not by themselves. Games are infuriating, they're frustrating, they can be inspiring, they can be connected, they can be intersectional, they can be captivating, but they're not fun by themselves. I mean, I've been there throwing the mouse across the room because the raid wipe, um, or you know, you, you think that you've got your, your puzzle solved and you, you screw it up and you, so you put your phone away and you go to sleep finally at two in the morning. Um, not that I've been there. <laughs> and so a few years ago, it, it had been it, a few years into me designing games and, and building them professionally that I came across this um, psychological model by a gentleman by the name of Scott Rigby who uh, studies video games and why people play them. And this is just one model of why video games are fun and interesting. Uh, but his, his theory is that there are three basic psychological needs. The need for competence, which is manifest by a feeling of being good at something, but also continually progressing at getting better at that. There's a need for autonomy. We need to feel that we have choices in the world and that our choices leave lasting impressions. And there's a need for relatedness. Um, and what, I'm, what I want to really talk about is this need for relatedness and how that connects to identity. All three factors are important. And it turns out that these are important factors, these are important needs to be satisfied in any sort of self-improvement paradigm. But they're also needs that match with, that correlate well with the best and most popular video games in that games that satisfy these needs for the players tend to be the most popular. So how do we do, how do we design for relatedness? How do we put that into a therapy game? The first thing is, look at, the, look at the player's needs. Don't look at what you want to design. Look at what the player needs. Relate to the player. The second thing is, and this is more important, don't make the player relate to you. Don't say things like, I'm sorry, you know budgets how they are, we just can't put a female avatar in as the protagonist. Don't make the player relate to your condition if you want them to be immersed in your environment. So who are we relating to when we design therapy games? It's it could be lots of people. It could be people who have experienced a, a trauma. It could be people with disabilities. Um, it could be people who can't afford treatment. And it could also be people who can't adhere to treatment. Many times, there are lots of cultural factors uh, that affect who has access to therapy. And because people can't access and afford it, they're not getting the care that they need and the care that they deserve. And video games are a low cost option for being able to access that. But in order to 
connect to that person, you have to understand what is it about their condition, and sorry about the, uh, the font thing there, um, what is it about their condition that makes their uh, condition unique? So I want to go through a few examples of what we've done uh, in our video game design to try to trigger relatedness and to try to connect to the user. And these are really just simple things that you can do uh, when building video games for therapy. The first thing is give the, option, give the player options to be like themselves. Whether it's avatars or environments or whatever it, or whatever it is about the player that you're designing, make them feel like they have a world that they belong to. So if you give them avatars of different body shapes and skin tones and genders, that's really important because then they feel like they belong in the world. And not just that, but give them the option to choose and to change their, their character, change their avatar. Um, genders change. Identities change. They can change frequently. They can change long, over a period of time. Don't gate that change, that ability to change, behind things like, oh, you have to spend $10 in real world money if you want to change the gender of your character. Don't make them spend in-game currency to change the gender of their character. Doing that alienates who they are. It makes them feel like they don't belong to the world. And it's not that you have to get everybody included, but you have to reach out and show the user that the world that you're trying to create the virtual environment is for them. They belong, they are home, and they are safe. Second thing you could do is design tasks that empower. So when I talked about the ADLs, the, the IADLs rather, uh, we talked about you know, putting away groceries. That's kind of a gendered activity for some people. So what are equivalent activities that you could do uh, that maybe aren't as gendered or maybe don't uh, trigger those, those uh, emotions in people? And one of them is uh, design, you know, taking care of a pet. When people have acquired an injury, particularly later in life, uh, one of the biggest motivators for getting back and getting well is that people don't want to lose their pets. Uh, so we, in this particular game, our, our stroke game, we put a puppy in there. Um, and so we have a bunch of activities that are built around taking care of the pet, uh, feeding it, giving it a bath, letting it out, and more than that, we actually put six puppies into the game, and you can go and adopt one. And so you actually get to pick which puppy you like. Um, and then beyond that, we also allow them to change the puppy. So if the puppy's misbehaved, they can just go and get a new one. <laughs> not really. We do allow them to change. Um, but even this is not really that. This, is not, this, this task is not immune to, to cultural insensitivity. If you were Muslim, for example, this might be an alienating experience. Um, so one of the things that we do is we make sure that our tasks, we give them choices, we give them options to not do that task. Third thing to help relate, design challenges that are familiar. Make them feel like the virtual world is something that will help them get back to their lives or join the, the world of everyone else that is not affected by the, the condition if they choose to do so. Uh, we have built a, a video game that's supposed to help people stop smoking. And so we have a, a, a work environment in which the user has to try to combat smoking urges, which actually triggers for, uh, for their nicotine addiction, um, which is actually a a very specific form of therapy known as Q-reaction therapy. Um, and so by doing that in a familiar environment versus an abstract virtual environment, you are able to connect more with that user and, and provide them with uh, a more realistic and relatable experience. Uh, same thing, we have gardening experiences. So rather than trying to put away groceries, uh, you're actually growing your own food. And by giving the person the ability to feel like uh, the world that they're in is connected to the choices that they're making. They can pick which groceries or which vegetables they harvest, for example. Uh, makes them feel more like they, again, makes them feel more like they belong in the world. And so there's some complications with this. Uh, almost no task is gender neutral, for example. 
uh, almost no situation is familiar to everybody. So it's really hard to, uh, to try to, there's no sort of universal design. You have to look at uh, all of your users uh, and try to make sure that you're not excluding anybody. And so the choices are, or the, option, the solutions are, offer choice. Give the users the ability to choose what they are going to do. Give the users abilities to choose their therapies and to choose which actions they want to take and which actions they're not want, willing to take. Let them repeat actions that they have more comfort with. And most importantly, be diverse in what you care for and what you create. So don't assume that they're going to relate to the environment that you've created because it's familiar to you. Um, and finally, I, I'll leave a few minutes for questions. But the other thing that is really important because these devices, or these, these video games that we create when we create them for therapy, these are medical devices. These are not video games for entertainment. And when you work in the medical space, or when you're creating things in, you know, that are supposed to help people's well-being, there's an oath that you should take, that doctors have to take, and that is do no harm. So even if your choices can't be perfect, you have to make sure that the choices that you're making, that the things you're asking your users to do are not going to harm them. So that's it. There's a few minutes left uh, for questions, if there are any. And thank you very much. Yes.